Okay, I'm recording. Perfect. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to be back talking to Johnny. Hey Johnny, how are you? Hey Debbie, I'm good. How are you? I am, I don't know if I could say great, but I'm okay. <laughs> I'm surviving. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's good considering the circumstances. <laughs> I keep I think, when I email people, I'm like, I hope you're as well as can be expected right now. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I hope you're healthy and safe and sane. <laughs> yeah, that's that's all we can really ask for right now. <laughs> I know it's like our sanity is the main thing that we're trying to keep together. Otherwise, oh my goodness, it's it's kind of crazy. And you're in the hubbub of everything. You're in New York City. I'm on the Upper East Side too, where all the hospitals are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So this must be pretty insane for you. What has it been like since this whole thing started and pretty much New York City has been shut down and you're in the middle of all of this? Yeah. So um, I was doing a lot of traveling at the beginning of the year and I got back from my last trip, um, which was to Charleston, South Carolina. I got back on Friday, March 13th. And by then things were already starting to get pretty weird. Um, you definitely saw toilet paper shortages and um, like a lot of tension if you went out to stores and stuff. Um, so that weekend was kind of normal, kind of a quiet weekend. Um, and then by Monday, everything was shut down. Um, so no more gyms, no more restaurants, no bars, nothing. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's gotten interesting is, um, you know, I always work from home if I'm not on the road. Um, but my partner works a traditional nine to five for the city government and he is now working from home as well. So we only have like a very tiny one bedroom apartment on the Upper East Side and our desks are like back to back. Like <laughs> I can basically touch him um, when I'm working. Um, so that has definitely required a little bit of adjustment, but we're, we're doing pretty well. And, you know, it's definitely a, a quieter, stranger time to be in New York, but um, you know, I don't think it's quite as scary as people outside the city expect it to be. You know, it's a lot of just stay at home, be cozy, um, try and avoid like going grocery shopping too much, that kind of thing. It's pretty insane that now everybody is working remotely and they know exactly what we have to go through because I think for most people, they think that what we do when we work from home, it's just like easy. Oh, you can do anything you want. Yeah. And then you realize that it takes a lot of discipline to be able to do this and you really need to set a routine for yourself. Otherwise you don't get anything done. That's and, so true. Right? So it's, what has it been like for your boyfriend and for you? Have you set a new routine together or what? I mean, for you, I mean, you're used to it, but for him, he's not. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, just stepping back a minute, I think one thing that's really been interesting uh, when I've talked to my friends who are now working remotely is they find that they're working more than ever. And I think that's been a big surprise for people is that when you are working from home, you have access to your work all the time. And, mm -hmm. and if you allow it to, it will dominate your life. Like the emails are not going to stop. You just need to make the choice to stop looking at them at a certain point of the day. So I think that's been interesting. Um, but yeah, um, as for like our schedule, he is still very much on a, uh, like he's supposed to be on a nine to five. Um, but his, I mean, he's just like working tons of overtime right now because um, he he is responsible for bringing in donations from corporations to help with um, help with the city. So that's just been nonstop. Um, but generally, we're both at our desks by eight thirty or nine. Um, my work has gotten a little bit slower than usual, so I've been wrapping things up sometimes by four, sometimes by six. It kind of depends on the day, um, and he'll generally keep working till a bit later, um, depending on what's going on. Um, but yeah, that's kind of our routine. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing the best that you can. And I think that's the main thing here is just whatever works for you at this time is what you can do with yourself. And hopefully you can concentrate. And I know a lot of people have children at home, so I can't even imagine what that's like because it's hard for us who don't have kids, who don't have that extra distraction. 
And going back to what you're saying, yes, this can take over your entire life. Like working from home, it's really hard to stop yourself from doing that because it's constantly in your within your reach and you don't know how to stop yourself. That's why having a stop time, a start time and a stop time is so crucial to all of this. Yeah. And like, if work is coming in, if I have a lot going on, I'll stop a lot later, but you know, I'm not, I really don't want to be like answering random emails at nine o'clock at night just because they exist. Like for, for me and my work, um, I'm not saving lives here. Like if I answer the email at nine o'clock at night versus 9am the next morning, nothing has changed. And I, I totally get it for, for people in other fields, especially, (coughs) especially professionals who are like helping with the crisis. Um, you know, they definitely need to be more available, but you know, if your job is more creative and you're not involved with healthcare or nonprofits, um, or other sort of emergency resources. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think like setting a stop time is really important. (laughs) Otherwise you're going to go crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Or it just gets nonstop. And I hear it from my friends when I, when I call them to catch up, like, and they're used to going to the office nine to five, they're like, I'm working till like eight, nine o'clock now. I'm like, you don't have to do that. Like if you're not, if you're not like saving lives or solving like major world problems, you probably can like give it a break by seven. (laughs) And that's really hard to do. And it's a good reminder to be able to do that. Yeah. Going towards what you do for a living. So Johnny is a writer. She's a freelance writer and she writes for a lot of publications. What has it been like for you as a writer right now? Has work been going well for you? Has it kind of dwindled down a little bit? And how do you maintain an income, especially living in New York City? It's expensive there. You know, even though the world is stopped, you still have to pay for food and rent. And it's really expensive living there. Yeah, it is a very expensive place to um, be self-employed for sure. Um, You know, so far the finances have been going okay. Um, Work has definitely slowed a bit. It is a lot harder to sell travel stories right now and, um, you know, cover trips that I've taken. So all of my travel writing has taken a backseat for now, unless it's kind of tangentially related. Like I have a story in the works about travel brands doing cool stuff on Instagram So, you know, I can do stuff like virtual travel and like covering the travel industry, but in terms of like covering, um, you know, travel experiences that has definitely been put on hold for now. Um, but luckily I've been able to lean into some of my other beats, um, specifically health and finance. You know, there are endless stories about health to be told right now, um, And then with finance, um, you know, I have some clients who like regularly give me assignments and I think a lot of people are concerned about money right now. So Mm -hmm. I'm able to write a lot in those areas. And I like, I like writing about that stuff. It's a different side of my brain than travel. Um, but I, I certainly miss travel. And then the other thing that's going on is, um, you know, the the economy has gotten really crazy Mm -hmm. and, um, a lot of, publications are cutting back on how much they're assigning to freelancers right now um, because they don't have the ad dollars coming in to support it. So yeah, things have gotten a little slow. I'm certainly not hurting for work. Like I still have plenty to do during the week, but you know, maybe like in a typical month I might have like, I don't know, 15, 20 stories like lined up for the next four to six weeks. Now it's more like six stories. And um, you know, the work's coming in, uh, like a little bit closer to deadline, you know, they'll say, I need this story by Friday. So whereas before I could get a bunch of assignments lined up way ahead of time, now they're coming in, like they're trickling in closer to when they actually want them to. So I have to just keep myself available, um, and keep, keep poking editors and be like, Hey, remember me? Like you want to work together? Um, So yeah, I think that kind of groundwork I laid over the past couple of years of, of, you know, being a really reliable, strong writer is paying off now. Um, What, you know, when they have very limited assignments to give out, they're going to give it to their, to their strongest writers first. For a writer, obviously you have been able to create this niche for yourself. That's not just travel because obviously the travel industry, anyone that's working in that platform is really hurting right now and you have created this great thing for yourself this great system that you're not only relying on one source of income and one source of niche 
for somebody who's also a freelancer or a writer, how can they diversify their own income to make money even through a crisis like this? So there's like two strategies when it comes to freelance writing. Um, the first strategy people recommend is that you should carve out like a very specific niche and be that person for that niche. So maybe it's sustainable travel. Um, and you're the writer all the editors go to when they want an eco-friendly travel story. That has not been the way I've had success. I've had success becoming more general and being like, I'm your writer if you want something really well researched, um, great quotes from sources, and um, like thoughtful language. Um, and, and that has worked really well for me. So, you know, you'll, you will, as you're researching like how to be a freelance writer, you will hear those two strategies put out there. Um, I definitely think it's like, if you are a person who has a lot of different interests like me, I think it's worth exploring those in your, in your writing. Um, and sometimes it requires starting small, like writing for websites and publications no one's heard of that don't pay very well, but you know, just to get your foot in the door and start getting some clips. And once you start getting clips, you can kind of abandon the clients that don't make sense for you anymore and pursue more lucrative projects. Um, and, you know, and start working your way up and, and eventually you will become known in, in multiple niches um, as a person to go to for that kind of content. So for me, that's been um, travel, health, wellness and finance. Uh, I've covered stuff outside those beats. I've covered everything from like home repairs and fashion, um, like restaurants and dining, like all sorts of things. But the ones that I've kind of found the most work in and the ones I found the most interest in it are um, travel, health, wellness, and finance. It's really great that you say that because obviously in the beginning when you're starting out, you don't know the niche that you want to go into yet. And even though sometimes you are interested in it, it may not be the right thing for you as well. So dabbling in a few things and then narrowing it down along the way can also really help. And I think we struggle with that a lot because we think, oh my goodness, I need to have a niche right now. Like this is what everybody is telling me, but what Johnny has been able to do, and it's actually been helping you now because if you had just niched down into one thing specifically, like with travel, you would be, it would be harder for you to find work right now because then you wouldn't have any experience with finance and with health and wellness. So that's a really great idea right there. Obviously, you don't want to be all over the place either because then people don't know where to put you in. But if you have two or three things that you're really good at, I mean, if you're a good writer, they're going to expect that from whatever niche that you're in. But having that experience is also really crucial to it. Yeah, I think if you only have one thing you write about, you leave yourself really vulnerable to the whims of that industry. Like, if you're a travel writer, you can't control what else is going on in the entire travel space. And, you know, there's a lot that can affect travel. There's, there's obviously environmental issues, like if there's an environmental disaster or something like that. And then, the, you know, the long term problem of global warming and how that might impact how we travel. Um, but there's political stuff like, you know, borders get shut down and things like that. And um, airlines close and, you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen that are outside of your control, but can that can vastly impact your income. So I think the more places that you dabble in and do it well. So, you know, like you said, you don't want to spread yourself too thin. You want to pick a few things, but you know, not, not 20 things, um, but do a few things really well. You leave yourself less vulnerable to everything external and you have a little bit more control um, from, from your own business standpoint. When you are trying to find new work right now as a writer and you're pitching, has there been any changes that you've been doing to that strategy? Any new um, tips and tricks that you can share with us that has been working well for you that you may have thought of because of the current situation that we have right now? I think, um, so with editors I already work with, I've tried to find new like COVID-19 rela related angles to the things I already cover. Um, so for my health, for my health editors, that's really easy. But even for finance, um, there's so many things to talk about with COVID-19 and your finances. So, you know, I try and find like a newsworthy spin. And I guess that's not necessarily new, but it's something I've been doing more of lately. Um, also knowing your editor's personalities, like I... I think everybody's really overwhelmed right now and 
I think we all need to show a lot more compassion and patience than usual. So I've been trying to do that and like not follow up too frequently. I don't want to like put pressure on people at a time when they're already feeling all kinds of pressures. Um, so just like really trying to be more human. Um, and then I've also been leaning into like, I think they're calling them like whisper networks, um, which I think I mentioned, but not using that word uh, on one of our other interviews, but basically groups of people in your industry who are doing the same thing as you and really sharing very good candid thoughts and, and information and advice um, and even warnings on, on like what's going on in the industry. So there are a few out there that I've recently um, started getting more invested in. One is called Study Hall. Um, and you can sign up on their Patreon to be part of their opportunities list and their newsletter and they, and their network. And, you know, it's a network of hundreds, if not thousands of writers around the world who talk about what's going on. And you can ask questions like, what does this publication pay? What editors are seeking pitches right now? They also put out like a big Google doc where people could add information about, um, which publications have stopped accepting pitches for the time being. And I think they open that up to the public. So anybody can look and say, oh, okay, these 30 publications are no longer accepting pitches. It, it kind of like helps you know where to put your efforts and where to just skip um, for now. So I think like those whisper networks are really, really, really helpful right now when like there's so many rumors flying around. <laughs> and that's the thing. I think I've scrolled through so many fake news everywhere, especially on social media, that you don't really know what's true and what's wrong. And having networks like this and people that you can actually trust giving you legit <laughs> information is what we all need. Otherwise, we're just going to be panicking all over the place. Yeah. I mean, if you just look at how, I, I, you know, I think particularly for listeners to the Off Beat Life podcast, um, people in the U.S. should be aware that, you know, they now have um, financial assistance for self-employed people from the federal government. This is like unprecedented, the first time this has ever been done. And there's a lot more questions than answers at this point about how to get that money. And it has been so hard to navigate that and, and see like all the crazy news stories coming out about it and the different comments on Facebook groups, people trying to figure it out. So yeah, it's nice to like have one or two networks you can tap into that you know have trustworthy information. So talking about that, Johnny, can you give us a little bit more insight on that, especially for people who have you know, freelance jobs and are really hurting right now, how can they get the best information or if you have information right now and how they can get those, um, the, the money that everybody wants, money. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I am probably not the best person to um, go to for that information because I'm still very much trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> but here's my understanding of it. Um, the federal government is giving self-employed people who have been financially impacted by the pandemic um, assistance of up to $600 a week uh, for the next few months. I think it runs through the end of July. Um, but the way that they have structured it is that it, it's not going to come directly from the federal government. The federal government's going to give state unemployment offices the money, and then the state unemployment offices are, um, are supposed to give it out to self-employed people. Um, but unemployment insurance is historically not for people who are self-employed. It's for mm -hmm. your regular, like full-time and part-time workers. Um, so the state unemployment offices are all scrambling to try and figure out how to, how to do this. Cause they're really just not set up for it. They're set up to process people who get, I think they're like W2 forms from their employer, uh, they're set up to process those. So um, at this point, at least in New York state, and this will vary by state, but in New York state, you have to apply for unemployment insurance through the state, then get denied because you will get denied, but you still have to go through the process. And then they give you another form to fill out for a pandemic unemployment assistance. I think that's what it's called. Um, and then they start processing that in a different way. But I don't personally know anybody who's gotten this money yet. I think that it's still very much a work in progress. And, you know, I've been following the New York State Department of Labor on Twitter, and they really are working so hard to try and get this done. You know, they, 
they have hired a lot of extra staff and have opened it up to like weekend phone calls and so many extra hours, but it's just a really, really, really big project and it's coming at the worst possible time for the government because so many people have to work from home. And it's not just that, right? There's so many things that the government has to worry about right now. It's like unemployment and then the health. It's it's just so many different things that it's overwhelming. I mean, obviously every single person is overwhelmed, but it's just one thing on top of the next. And since totally. Johnny, you do a lot of writing when it comes to health and mental wellness and health wellness, obviously. What has been the best thing that you have come across for, I guess, all of us to just get through this? Because it's really hard and everyone is either, you know, just like, okay, we got to just get through this. And then there's people who just can't even get out of bed. So there's so many things happening, right? And it's different for everybody. So how do you actually write articles and make sure that you are helping, you know, a lot of different groups of people during this time? Yeah, I think that's a big challenge. Um, I try and make sure all of my writing um, is sensitive to what people are going through right now. You know, I don't ever want to be accused of being tone deaf or, um, you know, uh, like I, I just wrote like a, mo- a couple of Mother's Day gift guides um, for Forbes and they had, one was about at-home yoga gear and one was about at-home workout gear, like cardio workout gear. And I really tried, you know, I had a mix of price points, but, um, you know, I wanted some luxurious products for the typical Forbes reader. So I'll put like a $1,500 treadmill in the gift guide, but then I wanted stuff like normal people could afford even if they are hurting for work. So, you know, I put like $9 hair ties in there um, to try and just be like really sensitive and, and uh, make the article feel like it could, it could have something for everybody. Um, But I think social media is a tough one right now. Um, You know, you see people on social media posting the 10,000 different ways they're, um, they're working on self-improvement during quarantine and they're baking bread and, and making all kinds of yummy food and working out like crazy and, and writing their novel and like all this stuff. (laughs) And really for most of us, I think you look at that and you're like, oh my God, I'm not doing it right. Like I feel Mm -hmm. bad about myself. Um, And, you know, I've had days where I do all sorts of things for self-improvement and like filling my day with things. And then I've had a lot of days where I've done nothing but kind of lay on the couch and watch TV and feel bad. Um, And I think you just need to take it day by day and not feel pressured to like bake 10 loaves of sourdough bread this week. And unless that's something that's really going to make you happy and feel good, like don't do it. You don't need to feel that kind of pressure. Um, But I do think like some sort of self care is important and, and that can be anything from binging reality TV, um, uh, to doing a really intense workout. It could be anything. Um, but for me, that's been a lot of home workouts and I've never been a home workout person, but I got this app called Allo moves and, um, it's great. They have all kinds of home workout classes, primarily yoga, but they also have like hit and bar and tons of other stuff. Um, and their yoga classes have been really like, a lifesaver for me during this time, like giving me both exercise and some sort of like spiritual element. And, um, yeah, that's the one thing I've been trying to do every day, even on days where I'm feeling like really bad and just want to watch TV. Mm -hmm. I'll try and do at least like half an hour of yoga. And I find that it helps me. I definitely agree with that. I have found that when Aaron and I don't work out for even just two days, we start going crazy. We start arguing with each other. Like, things just start going into spiral and you get in a really bad mood and it turns into a really low mood. So we figured that out. (laughs) And now we try to do our workouts and set a routine. It's like we wake up, we go do our um, workout and then we eat breakfast. It's like, it really helps with your mood, especially during this time when we can't really do much. And just a little things like that, like home workouts or a quick walk or run if you can't do it, helps with your mood for sure. It really does. And like, honestly, I don't like to exercise. I'm not one of those people who's ever going to be, can you hear that? Yes. The dogs. That's Sorry okay. about that. I don't this know. This is what outside. happens. 
outside. <laughs> but I'm never going to be one of those people who's like, yes, can't wait to get to the gym. Like, mm -hmm. going to get my workout on. I'm not. I don't like it. But yeah. I feel good afterward. And I try and like remember that feeling as I'm going through the the discomfort of sweating and getting your heart rate up. Like I don't enjoy it, but afterward I feel good. And I definitely notice a difference, especially I think the two day mark, if I don't do it for two days, that's yeah. when things start to really feel downhill. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I, I don't enjoy it either. I mean, I run because I love cardio and it's the easiest right now because where I am, like there's nobody here. But we actually just ordered a punching bag and I love kickboxing. Oh. So <laughs> Debbie, you're going to be a fighter after this. No, Well, <laughs> we, we actually love like kickboxing. We've been like, we've done it for a really long time. Like, uh, I think I stopped like a few months ago and then now I'm like, I need this. I need this so bad just to get aggression out. Cause there's so much mood. Like even if we're fighting, like instead of getting at each other, we have the punching bag to do it. So yes, I love it. I love it. I've even started jogging outside. Mm -hmm. I am, I've said my whole life, I am not a runner. Like yeah. I hate it so much. And in the past I've tried, I've even like said, okay, I'm going to run every day for a month. And then I'll like it. And I never do. But I started doing it again. And I don't hate it right now. And I think maybe it's because it's like the one, the, the you know, one of the very few times a week that I get outside. Um, and I get to go see buildings and trees and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's definitely it, this, this period of time has definitely reminded me to make exercise a priority. And, and that's something I really want to carry through. Um, even when life gets back to normal and my schedule gets busier, I really want to keep prioritizing my workouts. Yeah. I also found that when I do work out, when we make that into our schedule and we prioritize it, I become so much more productive and I want to do so much more. And I've realized that, you know, we both agree. It's like, it's a two day mark when I don't work out for two days and I just get up and usually I go work out. And if I don't do that, I just want to sit on my couch all day doing nothing. And I just feel so horrible about myself. And I think if we just do those little things and obviously we can't work out all the time, but those little things really matter right now. And it's they really have. do. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's so true. And you know, the other thing that's really changed for me during uh, quarantine is I've stopped setting an alarm to wake up. Like, unless I have something very important early in the morning to do, I don't set an alarm and I just wake up when I, when I'm naturally going to wake up. Yeah. And it has made such a difference in my mood. I still wake up around the same time. Yep. Like some days it's 6.30, some days it's 8.30. It really depends on like how I've slept and I, I have insomnia problems. So I'm, you know, I try and just let myself sleep. Um, but you know, prior to this, I would always send an alarm for, it depended on the day, maybe seven <laughs> or eight o'clock. Um, and it, I'd wake up so groggy. And now that I'm not putting an alarm on, I'm still getting up with plenty of time to start the day and, and feeling so much better in the morning. Yeah, I haven't really done that either. We usually don't set an alarm. Like when Aaron uh, used to work at his day job, we would do that because he has to wake up. And now that he doesn't, we, like you, we wake up around the same time every single day we do without even an alarm clock. So that's, mm -hmm. I mean, your body gets used to it. And I think we have an internal alarm clock unless you didn't sleep well the night before and you just can't get up. But it's awesome. It's awesome. Not it's to great. Have an alarm. It's so much better. <laughs> I'm not going back to an alarm. The, like from now on, the only time I'm going to set an alarm is if I have a, like a morning interview to do or like a flight to catch or something like that. Like I'm not doing it. Yeah, <laughs> Just for absolutely. The sake of it. who cares? Who cares if I start work at 7:30 or 9:30? Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Thank God. Thank God for the little things. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So Johnny, are there any other tips that you can share with us as a freelancer, as a writer that we can take away from this? You know, obviously there's a lot of days we're not productive, but <laughs> yeah, well, I think, um, there are going to be days when you're not productive, sometimes by choice, sometimes by not. Some days there's just not going to be anything to do because the work is slow, um, and I think like finding other things that make you feel good during that day can help 
make the time go by, <laughs> which is important. Um, but yeah, I think also having some sort of personal project that you have in your mind to, to do if things get slow, that might be able to make you income later on. I think working on that kind of stuff right now could it's a good time to pursue that kind of thing. So right now, May looks really slow for me. And I'm hoping, I think, and I hope that that will change over the next couple of weeks. But right now, it's a pretty slow looking month. And I've been toying around with the idea of writing an ebook on how to be a freelance writer. So that might be a good time for me to start that project. And, you know, it's a good it's a good way to balance it out if, if you have not a lot of money coming in, but a lot of time and energy to work on something that could end up, you know, bringing in some more money down the road. Um, so it, I think it's a good time to really invest in yourself, invest in your business and invest in those side projects that you've been wanting to do and that, you know, you haven't had time because you've been working on your business. Um, you know, if things are slow, now's the time to do it. Like you, there's nothing to lose by doing it now. Absolutely. We have a lot of time. Well, some of us do. And yeah, instead of, I guess just wallowing in our own self pity. We got to do. Yeah. <laughs> and like try not to get too discouraged if things are slow. It has nothing to do with you. You're not a failure. It, it's just a really unprecedented time. And I think the world's going to be a very different place when this is all over. But I think that you just need to keep working on it and also know when to stop, when to stop for the day. Mm-hmm. Have you done a few hours of like good good work today and nothing's coming out of it, it's okay to call it a day and come back to it tomorrow. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we have more. Honestly, I don't even know what day it is anymore sometimes. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every day I'm like, what day is it again? What day is it again? <laughs> even the weekends feel the same in a way because I'll sometimes push work off till then and and my boyfriend's still working on the weekends. Um, so Saturdays and Sundays sometimes still feel like a work day. Yeah. So it's a, it's a weird time, but I think we all need to just be really, really gentle and patient, patient with ourselves and with others. Yeah. Cause you know, we got nowhere to go during the weekends either. So what are you going to do? Yeah. Last weekend I made a lasagna for the first <laughs> time. I'm like, this will be my activity for the weekend. <laughs> it's like, yay. That's yeah. so awesome. All Something I do different. is do calls with my friends or family and especially with my family they're cooking all of this food and I just watch oh. them eat it's like my family's mukbang and I'm like oh my god why aren't you here to cook this for me this is not right <laughs> <laughs> you know what we've started doing um we found this company that makes they, they call it an Indian tiffin and they basically will deliver like six different curries to my apartment oh. once a week with all these like nice Indian breads to go with it. Um, and that has been like such a pleasure during the week to just be eating Indian food all week long. <laughs> oh my God. You're making me crave Indian food now. Thanks a lot, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You should definitely order. <laughs> oh my God. We are going to definitely like hang out when this is all over and I'm going to give you a big hug because I'm just going to be hugging everybody. I don't care if you're a stranger. I know you. Like I'm not. Your arms are going to be so buff from kickboxing too. (laughs) It may hurt a little bit, but you're going to take it. (laughs) You will give them a big, strong, muscly hug. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you so much, Johnny, for sharing all of this with us. I really appreciate it. If our listeners want to know more about you, where can they find you? Um, You can go to my website, johnnymsweet.com, or check me out on Instagram at johnnysweet. Perfect. Thank you so much, Johnny. I am really looking forward to seeing you in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. I hope so, too. And stay safe in Florida. I can't wait to see you soon. Thank you, Johnny. You, too. Okay.